Hey, Smash fans, how you doing? Thank you for joining the show. Uh, let me just bring my notes up so we can uh, make some sense of this. So, do you want to build your own robot? Don't know where to start, what you'll need, or how to do it? Then you're in the right place. Um, if you want to um, look at today's show, we have uh, all about sound and music today. Um, so, we'll we'll look at. Um, a number of things today. I've got some other talking points as well. So uh, my name is Kevin. Um, come with me as we learn to build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. So in this session we'll be adding a buzzer to uh, an Arduino. So I have a, a number of little buzzers. I've got a whole box of these, these tiny little components. If I just do that you can see it's got a little plus symbol on it there. They are very, very simple things to, uh, to add to our Arduino and some motor shields actually come with these attached. So if I show you this one here, that's got one, oops, just there. So this is the Fundumoto shield. Uh, so we're gonna learn how to make it beep, how to do some music, some tunes, um, and if we have time, add it to our Dabble app as well. Uh, and they also wanna talk to you about Microbit. So uh, my new Microbit arrived um, this week. So you can see on the right hand side, this, uh, sorry, this one, that's got a load more circuitry on it. So we'll have a look at that as well in a bit if we have time. Cool, so let's get over to Keynote. Let me uh, bring up my slides there. Okay, everything looks good there. So, sound and music. So as I said, the goals for this one, um, add a buzzer, excuse me, uh, make it beep. Um, make um, a specific tone, uh, a, a specific pitch, uh, create some sound effects and play some tunes. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I would say this is kind of a, a bit like last week's, between beginner and intermediate. Um, there may be some breadboarding involved if you if you haven't got um, you know, some wiring up skills. And there is some code as well. And it's more the music theory, I think, that's the more complicated bit of this one. But... It's reasonably straightforward, I would say. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Okay, so, peas or buzzers. So I've got a, a number of these here. So again, let me just show you this uh, to the screen. So it's a tiny little component, if I just do the uh, magic. Now one leg is slightly longer than the other, and that long leg there has the plus symbol, if I just show you that there, attached to it. So the long leg has the plus symbol. And um, that helps us identify which, which pins need to go to which pins on the Arduino. So you can see they're very, very simple. They just have two legs, plus and minus. Positive one is slightly longer. Not believe that anymore. So wiring up could not be simpler. So I've got an Arduino here. And I've got... Um, let me just pull these off. I don't know why I've uh, done it this particular way. I'm just going to pull off two wires... It's got some um, DuPont cables here, so there goes the, uh, the buzzer. So what I'll be doing is just pushing some cables into this. Let me just go full screen for a second. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to choose white for the longer leg, which is the positive, and the negative one is going to go to the shorter one. So the DuPont cables I've got there, it's got the female end there, the male end that side. And these are simply going to go into the Arduino. So the ground is dead easy. We can just pick any of the ground pins on the Arduino. And then the positive one, I'm going to plug into pin four. And we'll talk about that in a minute, why that particular one. That's it, actually wiring it up. Again, let me just make this focus. Very simple. So pin four on the Arduino, I can just see that there. The other one's going to ground. And then they just go into the, the positive, because to the... Uh, Pin 4, the negative disk goes to ground. Very, very simple. Now, if you have one of the Fundu Moto boards, such as this one here, this has already got a buzzer built in. And the reason why I said it will become obvious in a minute, that buzzer is already pre-wired into pin 4. So if I just unplug this for a second, plug this motor shield in, this has the exact same effect as plugging that into to pin 4. So that comes already installed. So if I just go to our overhead for a second, we've got a little robot here, which has already got the um, Fundimoto board installed. There's our little buzzer just there. He's also got a Bluetooth and a face attached there, but we don't need to worry about them today. It's just about the, the buzzer that we're interested in. So we're going to make some noise today. If you've got any pets, they're going to go mental as we, as we learn to uh, make these things um, 
make noise. So let me just go back to our keynote presentation. There we go. So like I said, couldn't be easier. Pin four, you can actually use any pin. If you want to do some more of the sophisticated stuff, you may need to use the um, PWN pins, which are the pins that have the little squiggle on the Arduino next to them. So such as 9, 10, 11, and what else? We've got five, six, and three, I think. So there's quite a few of them who are specifically set up for pulse width modulation, but I'm not worrying about that today. We're just doing some really basic stuff. Okay, so let's go back to Keynote there. So how do we get this to make a beep? So the beep program is really, really simple. So I'm gonna just talk you through this code and then we'll actually try it out. And um, we'll see how we can make it beep once or continually as well. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set one of the pins to be the buzzer pin. So we already talked about that being physically pin number four. So we have to say into the code that the pin mode for this uh, code is gonna be an output and we want that to be pin four. So we create a variable, which is an integer, just a whole number. Um, we say that's four. And then in our setup routine, we just need to say that the pin mode for the buzzer pin, which is pin four, is output, because we just want to send it outputs via the digital write. And then in our um, loop, what we're gonna do is do a digital write, which will make the pin go high or low. We specify the pin that we want to send the signal at, which is gonna be our buzzer pin, pin four. And we're gonna set that initially to high. And then next we're gonna do a delay. So this is kind of what makes the magic happen. If we just did a digital write high and then left it, um, it would just buzz forever. We would have no control over it. So we need to have some kind of delay and we want to be able to switch it off as well. So we need to switch it off also with a delay because when we put that into a loop, that can create a waveform. So if we're just doing this once, we might just say set it high and then delay and then set it off without a delay. So that's a couple of different things we can do there, but we're actually having this in some kind of loop because we want to make a waveform, which we will do. Um, we need that second delay as well. And the reason we pick microseconds is we're gonna do some things that are ridiculously fast. So when we're talking about um, pitches and noise and things, we start talking about number of cycles per second. So let's get into, um, oh, should we actually, before we get into that second one for the sound effects, should we try this code out? So I'm gonna bring up my Arduino and we are going to, that's a bit more advanced one, let's just bring up the uh, the first one, which is, um, is it demo two? Nope, it's demo one. I've obviously created a few of these in advance, so just bear with me while I get the first one, which is our beep demo. There we go. So this is the one that we've literally just had on screen. So let me make this a bit bigger so we can see it. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Right, so what I'm gonna do um, on the overhead camera, I'm just gonna show you, I'm just gonna plug in, um, yeah, let's not do it on the robot first, let's just do it on here. And this might have some code, that's already got some code loaded, so just ignore the beeping for a second. And then back over on the screen, spoiler surprise there. So back over on the um, screen there, what we're gonna do is we're going to click the compile and upload button. So let me just do that, plug it in. Shush. And then what I need to do, it's just complaining there because uh, I've got several different Arduinos that I'm using here and they're on different ports. So again, just for sort of full transparency, what I'm doing here, uh, if I do it that way, then I click on tools, I click on port, and when I plug this in, the port that I need will appear. So that's just all that was complaining about there. So. Right, port. There it is. Okay, and now we can upload. Right, so there we go. What an amazing piece of code, if not slightly annoying. So what we'll do now, just to make this so that we can run it once, instead of having the actual beep there, I'm gonna cut that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that into its own function. So let me just cut that. I'm just gonna come up here in between loop and I'm gonna create a new void. We'll call this one beep. Beep with uh, two E's. I'm just gonna paste that code back in there. And then in our setup, we're just gonna make it do it once. If I put it further down, 
into the loop, it'll keep beeping again and again and again. It'll keep going over and over and over. We don't necessarily want that. So let's try this now. I'm just going to do the uh, compile and, um, and upload again. So let's just plug that in. Oops. And I just need to have that semicolon at the end. And away we go. OK. So now when I press when I press the reset button, which on the shield is that one there, it should beep once. And at the moment it's beeping, but it's doing it that fast because I've got the microseconds too, too quick. So let's slow that down there by adding an extra zero onto it. So what I'm just doing on the code there, just adding a few extra zeros to try and slow it down a bit. So let's just upload that. There we go, that's a bit quicker. Let's add an extra zero in each again. Upload it again. So we're just getting a little pip at the moment. Let's add an extra zero again, see if that makes any difference. That's a lot of microseconds. We could probably use the delay function rather than microseconds on this particular one. Hey Tom, no worries. Um, so Tom's just saying he's got to uh, <laughs> got to go. The kids have got oh, the kids are fast asleep. I'll be back, and we'll be making loads of noise on this stream as well. So sorry about that. <laughs> right. So let's get back to our our keynote slides. So let me just bring up keynote there. So that's how we make uh, a beep. Um, it's very very simple. We we put that buzzer high. We wait a, a period of time. We put the buzzer low. So we do that via digital writes to the pin four. But as you can hear, it's not very good. It's sort of pecking and making a funny sound, but um, we'll get onto a better way of making sounds in a second. So what we can do now is we can create a for loop that will change the, the value of that delay um, dynamically. So as the loop goes through, each time it goes through around the loop, that delay will get slightly larger or slightly smaller. So on this one, it's gonna get slightly larger uh, and we'll see what happens on that. So let me bring up the, um, this one is called beep to alarm. So let me just bring that one up. And I think we already have that one open, beep to alarm. There we go. And let's just uh, compile this one and then we'll talk about how it works once it's uploaded. It sounds like some kind of house alarm. Don't know how bad that sounds on the audio. Yep, sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? Right. So let's talk about how that's actually working, shall we? So we've got the same code that we started with before. We're still on buzzer pin four. Um, we still have the pin mode as the output. Let's make this a um, full screen so we can see it. Um, and what happens differently here is we have this for loop. So depending on what your programming skills are like, um, I know sometimes I can go too quickly for the beginners, so uh, I'll, I'll pause a little bit on this one and explain it a little bit more. Uh, for people who already know this, you'll just have to uh, bear with me while I explain this. So let me just go back to my keynote. So for loops have three arguments. So uh, I'll do my air quotes there. An argument is something that we pass to it as a parameter. Um, so the three parameters that we're going to pass it, the first one is what is the counter for this loop? So four loops will go around a number of times. They'll go around for the number of times that that count um, is still true or that that condition is still true within it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say we want an integer that we're going to call i. We could have called it anything. So i is just um, a common sort of placeholder for doing counters. And we're going to give it the value 10 initially. So int i equals 10 says, create me a variable of type integer. It's a whole number. Um, we're going to start it with value 10. Next, what we're going to do, the next, um, which is just this bit here, i is less than 1,000. So this is a test for the loop. So it's going to keep going around the loop until this test um, fails, until it becomes false. So i is going to start at 10. And at some point, i because we're going to do something to it, is going to become up to a thousand and possibly go above a thousand. What we're saying here is it should stop the loop once it's less than a thousand. So um, otherwise keep going around the loop. And then the last bit is the thing that changes that value. So I plus plus is a shorthand in C plus plus for saying add one to I. So plus plus just means add one to the whatever the current value of I is. So I starts at 10, goes around the loop, 
next time it goes round, the plus plus will say, make it 11, just add one to that. It'll go round again, add one to it, make it 12, and so on. It'll do that until it gets to a thousand, and then the loop condition will be met, and it'll come out of that loop. So that's what that loop effectively means. Um, I'm labouring the point because I know that for some people, things like this will be just like, what is all this very cryptic looking um, code mean? For people who are quite um, experienced coders, this will be regular. You use for loops all the time in code. Uh, for people who've not seen them before, these three things can look quite cryptic. So we have that semicolon in between them just to separate out the three parts, of the three arguments. So what's happening in our loop then? We're starting with value of 10. The digital write makes the buzzer go high. It waits for the milliseconds of I. So initially that'll be 10 milliseconds. It'll then digital write it low. Again, wait for I, which is 10. And then it'll go round again. At this time, it'll be 11. So each time it goes round, that delay is getting bigger and that's changing the waveform. And we'll talk about waveforms in a moment. So the effect is that we get this pulsing effect. You can hear it changing, changing pitch. Right, so let's have a look next. So waveforms, I was just talking about waveforms there. <clears throat> so if you think back to your physics days or if you're if you're not at school and you've not done this yet, <laughs> sound is just the compression of air. And the number of times that that happens is called, you know, uh, how that happens is, is a cycle. So we'll have an amplitude of the wave, the waveform, over time, it'll it'll sort of cycle up and down. And that might be the wave front, that might be the compression itself. Um, or in this case, with, with when we're thinking about this logically, um, we just want to identify that one cycle is equal to one hertz. So a measurement of, of uh, a sound wave is, is one hertz. So one sound per second is one hertz. The amplitude, the height and depth of that wave um, is the amplitude. So you only measure it from the from the midpoint up rather than the whole height. So the amplitude, we don't really have any much control over that with our Arduino. We're just kind of sending it five volts effectively by making it high. And whatever that little thing is geared for, um, the maximum sign that comes out of it will be what it will be. So what happens with the... Um, what we're trying to do by doing this digital write is we're actually creating what's called a square wave. So it goes from being nothing to being 100% of the amplitude for the amount of time that we say high. And then when we say low, it then drops right back down to the very bottom and then bottoms out again until we say go high again. So you get this very, very square wave and that's why it is called a square wave. Um, they're not great for, for quality of sound. They tend to sound very robotic very industrial because um, it's harsh and we like sounds to be rounded so that's not going to work for, for sort of quality of sound for us but that's how we effectively do it and again the period of time um, where the wave starts goes down and goes up again that's our cycle or it's also called a period and if we want to control that waveform the shape of that waveform we need to control it over that period by looking at when it goes high and when it goes low and slicing the delay in totality into two parts so that the totality of those equals the pitch that we're looking for. And the pitch we will get onto now. So each pitch is expressed in a number of hertz. So on our piano there we have um, 261.6 hertz is middle C, is C4 on a, on a keyboard and we'll look at that in a second. Um, we can see some of the values there, so very, very low, 33 hertz, 33 times per second. So imagine it one second being this 33 up and downs in there makes C. And the difference between C and C sharp is 2 hertz. So that's a very small amount of difference. And again, another 2 hertz makes it a D. That difference sort of stretches over time. But you can see there, um, it's not very much difference. So... That's what we're talking about there. These ups and downs, this is our cycles per second. Again, 33 of them to make our C note. And these C, the, again, if you if you don't know what these things are, this is piano notes. Um, you can play on any instrument, obviously, but I'm thinking about a piano here. And the piano keys, this is an octave. So we have um, seven keys there, and we have the five black keys, the sharps and flats. And we start with a C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then it repeats again. So 
that's what we mean about the notes having a particular value. They have a particular number of cycles per second. So on a piano, you typically have eight, uh, sorry, seven octaves. Um, on an organ, you might only have five um, octaves and they might shift. So um, octave one on a piano, um, sorry, octave two on a piano will be octave one on an organ. But for our intents and purposes, uh, we can look at um, these particular notes here and each octave is given a number, one to seven. So what we then do is we say C3, for example, is C, which is that key there, um, and it's the third octave. So C3 is the third octave of C. So that has a value of 131. You can see the differences there are not two hertz anymore. They actually stretch out the higher the, the notes we go. So the difference between C3 and C sharp, which is that black key there, is actually eight hertz. So it's quite a bit different than the, the lower value further down the octave range. So what we need to do in our code, if we want to play a tune, is we need to define all these different notes and we have a file with them all in. You can actually find them very easily on the internet, but we've already got definitions for these. And rather than having to sort of say how many hertz this is, and remember that, we can just define a shortcut for that. So this hash define C3131 um, effectively defines wherever in our code we say C3, the compiler will go, ah, you mean 131, and it'll just replace that when it compiles it. So it makes it a lot easier for us to, to create tunes and so on. So if we're going to play some music, um, there is a much better way rather than doing that high and low um, and digital right. There is actually a command called tone, which is far more suited and creates much nicer, smoother waveforms. So that's part of the Arduino library. And to use it, we just say tone. We say what pin we want to create the tone on. So in our case, we would say tone brackets four, then comma, and then the note that we want to play. Um, again, we would have to give it in hertz so we can use our our definitions that we've defined just on the previous slide there such as c3 and then the duration how long do we want that note to be so we can have a look at that in a minute what that means and that's kind of like if you're pressing down the key and then letting go the duration is how long we have our finger on the keyboard the delay is kind of irrelevant to that that's um you know the once the note stops playing and uh, yeah no tone is basically stop playing any tone so it's a way of sort of making sure that there is no tones playing. So it can only play one tone at a time. It's monophonic, as they say. Um, but we can actually build up some uh, quite cool tunes from that. So again, just quickly dipping into some music theory, and I really won't labour this. Um, there are different lengths of note. So if you consider those two things to be to get my hands within the screen there a bar so when we have like written music a bar is when you have a beat such as a metronome's ticking the duration between that and the next one is a bar so if we have one note between those metronomes ticking that's called a semi brief it's a whole note if we have two notes within that bar so if this thing's ticking and we have like tick 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 <laughs> tick tick <laughs> quite difficult to do while you're trying to explain this um that's a minim if we have four notes, that's called a crotchet. If we have eight notes, that's a quaver. Then we have the semi-quaver, which is 16 notes within a bar. And sometimes, if, if it's humanly possible to play, we have demi-semi-quavers, which is 32 notes within um, a bar. That's a lot of notes. <laughs> sometimes you might find these in music, but um, I think you would have to be quite expert to, to be able to play these. Uh, and you, you don't normally play 32 notes, it's just usually a 32th of a note that you might need to play there. The rest of them might be um, pauses or so on. So be aware that there are different lengths that we want to be able to play, and that's what in our previous slide there the tone duration is, is about. So we might talk about an eighth of a note and so on, and that's what we mean there. So um, music and notes and durations. So what we're going to do in our code, we are going to store the notes. So all the notes that we want to play... So I've got the notes here to happy birthday. So G4, G4, A4, G4, C4, B4. So they're all on the fourth octave. And it's like G, G, A, G, C, B, and so on. G, G, A, G, D, C. So it goes up and so on. So we're going to store them in an array. And the reason that we're doing the G4 is so we don't have to type in the exact hertz. It's much 
easier for us to think when we're thinking about music to think about the notes rather than the exact frequency that each notes of these are at. So that's how we define a, a, an array. We do int because it's an array of integers. We give it a name. We have the square brackets to say this is an array and then we can actually define what's in that array. So equals and then our curly braces with our semicolon at the end. Now the note durations we have to store in a separate array. We could store them together as some kind of dictionary, I think it's called. But um, for this reason, we're just going to we're going to keep them separate. It's kind of easier and also a bit more complicated as well to think about these things being separate. But essentially, how long we're going to hold the notes down for, we store in a separate array. So that two there corresponds to that how long that G four is is held down, the second one to the second note, and so on. Now, when I was putting this together, I don't think I've got these right at all. And we can probably have a listen to this in a second and see what that sounds like. So how do we put all this together then? So we've got our array. Um, we need something that will actually take that array and interpret it and play the music. So this is what this very small, if you look, it's actually only got one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code. The rest are just comments as reminders. So our play melody function is going to say, it's a for loop. So again, we have the three um, uh, parameters. The first one is an integer, which is going to be our counter. So this note, this note is going to be the counter. We're going to set it to zero at the beginning because we're going to go through the array and arrays always start at zero. Uh, this note is um, the counter condition. So when we say if it's less than 12, um, really, we could say less than the length of the array. That would probably make more sense, but on this one, I think I've just arbitrarily picked 12 for some reason. And then what we say is this note plus plus. So we're going to add one to whatever the value of this note is. So first time round, it'll be zero. When it gets to the bottom of the loop, <clears throat> comes back to the top, it'll add one to it. So it'll become one on the next time round. OK, next then. Um, so you can see there to calculate the note duration, take one second and divide it by the note type. So if you remember on the other slide, we had like quavers, demi quavers and so on, depending on what the note is. Um, and again, you might have to just trial and error this. <laughs> I would say most things are either whole notes, half notes, probably a quarter note, probably not much difference in that. And then what we then do is just divide the note type. So if it's a quarter of a note, a four, divide 1000 by four, because a second is a thousand milliseconds. And that's what we're going to use for our uh, pausing between notes. And that's what the pause function uses. So we're not using the delay in microseconds, we're going to use milliseconds instead. And then what we will then do is, so we say uh, the note duration is a thousand divided by the note duration from that array. So when it's going around its loop, it knows whatever this note is, it's also looking in the uh, note durations array and having to see which which particular cell in the array is up to there and picking that value as well. So that will change and that's why it's, it's a variable. And that's what the bracket brackets mean. They mean whatever is in that particular array at that point using this note, which is changing through our loop. And then we say we want to actually figure out what the pause is. So the integer pause between notes is note duration times by 1.3 means about 30%. So you might figure out that this is too slow or this is too fast. So this is kind of a fudge factor to be able to, excuse me, sort of speed up and slow down the tempo um, because you might not quite have got it right. And then we do the delay. So a pause between notes is our delay. Uh, and then after that pause, we say no note. So it stops playing the note. So that's going to be our play melody function. That isn't going to change, but we can change all the different um, melodies and so on that we do. So um, let's get to the next bit. So if you're enjoying this video, uh, you like these, again, please like, comment and subscribe. This helps the channel grow. We're quite a small channel at the moment. We've, you know, we've not got a thousand subscribers. We've only got a quarter of that at the moment, though it is growing every week. We get about two new subscribers a day currently. Um, so please do be one of those subscribers. It helps the channel grow, helps me get where I want to go with uh, my sort of audience participation. Um, again, if you like the video, comment in the comments below. Um, tell me what you do or do not like about it. Um, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. These things are signals to me as well. So just a reminder to do that. So let's go back to the code and um, let's have another play with some other bits and pieces. So we had a look at the alarm 
Um, before we get onto some notes, I think there is another one which is similar to the alarm. Let me just find it, which is, um, let me just open up. I think it is alert. So there's alarm and then there's another one that's called alert. So this one's got slightly different sound to it. We'll just plug this one in again. So apologies for the sound that's going to come out. Right, let's just compile this and upload it. So, this one sounds slightly different. This is more like a house alarm. So that one, come back to me for a second. That one is kind of going up and down, up and down, rather than just going whoop, whoop. It's, um, there's two parts of the loop. So if we just look in the code there, uh, we can see that there is um, the first loop will count between 50 and 500. The second loop will count down from 500 to 50. And instead of doing I++, it does I minus minus. So it's actually doing the opposite, and it's counting down. So that's why we get that sort of dual phaser effect. Listen again. It kind of goes up, down, up, down. So that's um, another one that we can do using two loops. And if, if you've ever looked in synthesizers and how they work, they have things called oscillators. And effectively what we're doing with this for loop and both of these for loops is creating oscillators, creating things that um, change value over time. Okay, so let's go next to, um, so instead of doing beeps, we're gonna look at some music this time. So let me find uh, the next one. So. Happy birthday. Let's see if we can get this to play. I don't think I've got this right yet, but let's give this a go. So just upload the code. Right. Doesn't sound great, that does it? Let's try and follow along as it does that. Ready? And it's only doing those 12 notes because I set the loop to 12. So what I'll do, instead of it being 12, I'm going to get it to figure out the length of, I think it's size of, size of, and then happy birthday. I think that might do the trick. Let's try that. <clears throat> So that's a bit more recognisable as happy birthday. Not great. And that's probably down to the uh, the note durations. I've really not spent enough time figuring out what they are. Uh, but you kind of get the feel for that there. You can see where we're coming from and how this is going to work. So we have note durations, we have the notes themselves. And um, I guess some of this is trial and error. You can probably play by ear if you have a musical ear, if you're pitch perfect. If not, um, you might struggle with this a little bit. So let me see if I have, I can't remember if I did any other ones actually. I know I spent quite a bit of time, oops, on this. Uh, and all the code will be available on GitHub on the usual repository. I'll, I'll show you where that will be. Um, what else did I have on here? So I'm sure I did another beep one. I was playing about with different um, rhythms and things and I think one of them sounded quite cool. Let me see if it's this one. Right. Oops, is it that one? Yes. It sounds like a drum beat. I don't know why that particular rhythm occurs in that particular way. I've got a loop, as you can see there. Uh, I equals one, and then it goes I equals less than 100, I plus uh, plus. But then on the second delay, 
I multiply the number of microseconds by a thousand, and this is the effect that I got. So by playing with these delays, we can create some interesting effects. So we can store each one of these as a different um, function, and we can put them all into one piece of code so that we can say, play happy birthday, or play the alarm, or the, um, the alert sound, or play this rhythm thing. We can have different ones play depending on you know, what we want our robot to do. So um, that's where we can sort of put all these pieces together. Um, so let me just have a quick look um, if there's anything else we're going to cover off on there. Don't think so. Right, so let's just do the comment of the week. Um, so I have that geared up, which is... Da -da -da. There we go. So Chip um, was asking, uh, thanks for the video. So this was the one that we did uh, with the faces a couple of weeks ago. And he says, the 8x8 matrix that came with my Arduino starter kit is a bit different. Yeah, 16 pins on the back, eight, um, of, eight on each two sides. There's no shield board, um, no shield or board with it. Any advice on how to make this work? Um, do I need a board or additional pieces to connect it uh, to the Uno and program it? So yes, typically these... Um, I'm not sure if I've got a spare one. I think I've got them all plugged in at the moment. They effectively have a driver board in the back. The ones I recommend, which is the Key Studio ones, um, they all come with um, the driver built in. So you just get these four pins exposed to the Arduino. So it's very easy to program for us. And what they've done here, um, they've created a, a, a matrix. So you've got one to eight on one side and one to eight on the other side. And they have um, a chip that will scan um, it'll scan through and say illuminate it'll first of all it'll say right we're on pin we're on row um row one and it'll say for column one illuminate that one illuminate that one illuminate that one it'll do that until it gets all the way to the end and then it'll go down to the next row and do the same um so it needs to have all 16 wires coming at so not all 16 all all yeah all 16 so two lots of eight coming into some chip somewhere and this chip can then do some what they call bit shifting uh, it's how keyboards work as well if you think inside your keyboard um, on your laptop or your pc there isn't like 102 wires coming out of that into one chip it will have columns and rows to try and reduce down the number of things that are required and this scanning technique is is how they achieve that um, and persistence of vision the fact that you can turn these on very very quickly and your eye will see that as being on longer than it actually is on because it can go down to the next one, illuminate them, go down to the next one, illuminate them, and they, they turn off effectively. Your eye doesn't see that, it just sees a steady state. And that's why sometimes when you point like a camera at um, lights and so on, in fact, if I go to my, my normal camera, if you look on my screen there, you can see there's a sort of funny phasing effect going on. That's because them LED lights are not on all the time. They're actually all going on and off all the time but the persistence of vision in your eye can't detect that they're going off because it happens so quickly you know 60 60 times a second 60 hertz and my camera if that's um, also running at 60 hertz that's where you get these sort of interference patterns happening i can actually adjust the camera and it will look even worse than that if i uh, if i play about with it so it's the similar kind of effect on these uh, these leds so that's kind of what's going on there um, so how to get round that, you can either get one of these chips, the driver chips, um, you would have to Google that I think and uh, Adafruit have some good guidance on that, or for the cost of it you can probably just buy a new one, because effectively what you're buying there is just the LED panel without buying the driver chip that goes with it. So my recommendation would be for the cost of it, um, it's more fiddly than it's worth to just to add a driver to it, um, so uh, you know I would say get, get yourself uh, an easier one to use. Um, the other ones could be used in a different project, but uh, it gets a bit fiddly to do that, trying to solder, because you're going to have to solder you know, 16 pins into a driver chip, and then from that driver chip, um, solder some headers and so on. Whereas you can just buy one of these for a couple of pounds. We have them on the uh, Smiles Fan store if you're interested. Um, so we use Key Studio, they're quite a good uh, range of them. So that's the uh, comment of the week. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of uh, call to action, so I wanted to sort of say if you've not visited the website, um, it's a great source of all information about SMARS. Um, it will be undergoing a major overhaul this year. Um, I'm currently working on um, some code to 
to make uh, a membership area in fact so that we can actually have a bit more interaction because at the moment this is just a series of static pages that I generate uh, using github um, it doesn't actually have any interactivity on there and I thought you know we could bring some of the interactivity from Facebook into there uh, we can create a members area as well so that we can um, you know we, we can have a more structured um, learning system in there because the learning system that's and this will still be for free um, there will be some paid content on there as well but the the free content will stay free um, you'll be able to take courses and see where you're up to on the course so it's more interactive in that way uh, and it will be more you know it'll manage the state better of where you as a person are up to in your your learning journey so that's what i'm looking at doing um, very shortly um, still loads of great content on there today and I'm looking at enhancing that and making it more consistent as well with this learning course. One of the reasons I'm looking at building this myself as well, um, it's quite expensive to purchase a monthly subscription to a membership site. So if I wanted to use something like, um, is it called Thinkific? Um, you know, it would cost me something like £40 per month just to host um, some tutorials on there, whether people subscribe or not so if i'm doing that for free that just be an outgoing of my own you know a couple of hundred pounds per year whereas i can build my own and have the same features and functionality so that's what i'm looking at doing there so check out the website some great stuff on there let me know what you think about that in the comments as well if you think there's something missing or something that should be built upon and the other thing i also want to draw to everyone's attention is that we have a new video every sunday so 7 p.m greenwich mean time uh, there are some of the other time zones around the world. Um, not everybody's based in the UK, quite a small country by comparison to the rest of the world. So the left hand column there, we have um, all these sort of Americas, uh, Canada, the middle column, we've got the sort of um, European and um, India and Pakistan with some Russia. And then on the right hand column, I think we have China and Australia and Russia as well. So a mixture of all the different time zones that I could come up with um, when I was thinking about how best to sort of communicate that we have new videos every week every Sunday at 7 p.m. live but you can always catch them on replay most people probably do we have um, currently got five people watching along so hi everyone if you've not put your, your name in the comments please do so so I know who's watching I can see that currently we have uh, we have a slow bird on that's Adam we have Tom and that's the only people I can see currently but I know that we have more people watching so um, maybe they're watching on more than one device who knows so that's my calls to action, as we call them. Uh, let me get back to uh, my slides and just see if there's anything else um, needed to cover off. So don't think so on there. So some of the things I was going to show you as well. So I have um, a couple of micro bits. Um, I've got more than the ones I'm showing you here, but these are the ones um, I had to hand. So the old one is this one on the left hand side. Um, you can see there's like a big area of the, the circuit board there that's kind of empty. This one, however, has loads. It's got a great big buzzer. It has um, lots of extra pieces. There's a little antenna there in the corner. So they've really, really enhanced this new, um, uh, this new micro bit. It has the usual kind of things that the other one has. It's just got more of the same. I think it's faster as well. Uh, I'm not sure I've got anything I can plug into to show you it working, but... Um, it can detect, it's got a microphone on it this time, so you can detect claps. Um, what else has it got, which is new? Speaker, processor, accelerometer, compass. And it's got all the usual stuff, all the, the pins on the bottom. The other side looks exactly the same too, so you can't really tell them apart from that side. Looks exactly the same, same form factor, same sort of size, but this one has a few extra things. They're still very cheap. Um, what I like about them, they can run Python as well. So I'll be looking at doing that now that we're in the new year, doing some extra programming videos on other types of chips. So I've got um, an Adafruit um, playground. I think they call these circuit playground, uh, circuit Python playgrounds now. Uh, and this one is kind of similar to the micro bit. It's, it's similar in size anyway, uh, and similar that it's got these similar kind of crocodile clip things around the edge. So if you've got, there's my desk power supply. There you can just unplug that. So the idea with these um, these things around the edges that you can just clip crocodile clips to them. So I think they're kind of designed for education where you, you know, you do, you're kind of building a circuit. You don't want to um, permanently solder something to this. So you can just clip something in there like that. So these run MicroPython as well. MicroPython is cool because it's Python and it runs on microprocessors. Well, 
tiny microprocessor chips, single system on the chips. And that means we can do so much more than we can on the, you know, the lonely Arduino, which is only an 8-bit chip. So these circuit um, Python chips tend to be 32-bit. I think the MicroPython is also 32-bit. This is 8 bits. 8 32 bits. That means there's a lot more power in these other chips compared to the Arduino. But the Arduinos are great for what they are. You know, they're a great learning tool. And the number of shields and add-on boards and code that's out there, software libraries, is, is basically unparalleled. Um, a couple of other things I was just reading through the drawers and I thought I'd uh, show you. So I have these uh, Inky Fats, which are little um, add-on boards for the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi Zero, actually. And um, I've got two different ones. I've got a red and black, and I have um, a yellow and black. And these things are a bit like the, the display that you have on uh, Kindle. So e-ink. And the cool thing is, look at the date on these. So I powered these up and flashed the calendar to these on the 29th of December 2018. And the bottom one on the 28th of July 2018. And they've still retained that image without any power. So that's just a, a kind of a durability test just to see how long these things last. I've never really thought what could be a good use for these other than maybe like a name badge if you're going to some kind of convention or something, but um, quite cool little devices. They, they take far too long to, to sort of dis to flash the display. And that's kind of what's put me off um, using them in any kind of you know real project. It takes about 15 seconds to, to flash because it's got four different layers of color. Um, it has like a white layer, a black layer is effectively off. Um, the red layer or the yellow layer <clears throat> and it's white, black, yellow, maybe it's just three layers. But effectively it takes a long time for it to flash each one of them. So you know, five seconds each. And that means that 15 seconds, it's not great for, for anything really. Who, who'd wait 15 seconds to see something on the display? Um, but they could be useful if you were trying to something that has a battery that might run out. You might want to show what it, it you know what it logged last, as long as it doesn't run out of power just as it's flashing the display, because then it'd be useless. But um, it might be useful for something like that where you want to sort of get a snap in time, and if power's lost, you can see what it it had left, um, what it flashed last. New ones might be slightly quicker, but they're the ones I had um, to hand. So that was the uh, things I wanted to talk uh, about with you. So next week, let me bring up my um, keynote again. So let's go over to yeah, that one, that one there. <laughs> uh, so next week, we're going to be looking at something called Jupyter Labs. So this is a cool, cool way of uh, learning code. So um, one of the problems that people have said time and time again um, is they struggle with programming uh, with robotics. So I thought, how can I help people learn better, easier, and something that's a bit more forgiving? Because one of the things that isn't forgiving when you're writing a code in, in, the, in the Arduino is you've got to write some piece of code, then you've got to compile it, it comes up with some quirky error message, you've got to fix that problem, run it again. Sometimes it doesn't tell you where the error is and it, it, it'll look further down. And those kind, that kind of loop of, of trial and error um, isn't great. And Jupyter Labs is something that will fix that. Um, it lets you effectively try out each line of code uh, one line at a time, but without having to run the entire thing. So um, we'll have a look at that next week. It's a really cool way of, of storing your code as well. So it's kind of both a way of writing code interactively. If you worked in colleges or schools, you might want to use this to prepare a lesson in effect. So you can say, right, we're going to run this code one line at a time. Uh, and you can put comments um, in rich text within and images and so on and links within the uh, the notebook the Jupyter notebook so this is a cool thing we're going to look at how to install that how to get up and running and we can interact with our Smars robots with it too so I've made our Smars lab fully um, Jupyter labs compliant compatible so we're going to be having a look at that next week that's pretty cool can't wait to show you that too so uh, any other comments from anybody who's watching along and see if there's uh, anything else um, Tom was saying about um, yeah he was sorry you had to go he had to get the kids to sleep. Um, Adam, I don't think you've said anything else since there. Just having a look on the comments there to see if there's anything else. Feel free to type something. There's always about a 10 to 15 second delay between me saying something and you actually hearing it. Um, so I just have to be mindful of that. That's one of the reasons I'd, I play um, a bit of a video clip as we do an outro, because um, if I end the stream 
and you haven't caught up. It ends it when I end it rather than the 15 seconds later that you're watching it. So it can actually look very abrupt if I press the button. So that's why I always have that bit of an outro. And it's also a way of um, having the overlay images, the overlay tiles from YouTube that appear. So again, that's something that uh, we put onto the back of the video. Uh, what I will be doing on the, the videos as well in future, I've done it on a few of them, but I've not done it on everyone. It's just slicing off the timer at the beginning because um, if you're watching this on replay, you don't want to sit for five minutes watching a timer countdown or scrub, scrub through to find out where exactly does it stop. Um, you just want to see the content. So I'll be uh, slicing off them from the front of them. It does mean we, leave the, we lose the live uh, comments. Unfortunately, that's just something that happens, but we don't lose the, um, the comments from the playback so we get to keep all them so i think that's uh, everything that i had co for covering off this week i'm just having a look to see if there was anything else i was going to talk about you might have noticed these um i've got lots of uh sensors on my my desktop here i've also got um 20 packs of these motor shields too excuse me one of the things i'm uh, going to be doing in the new year which we're now in the new year is building some kits that people can buy uh, and one of the problems I had with the store is that um, it can take quite a long time for things to arrive because um, they get shipped from China direct to wherever you are. Sometimes that's a good thing if you live near China. So if you're if you're living if you live in China, for example, if you live in um, you know next door to that in Australia or somewhere, then the shipping times can actually be quite quick. Um, however, if you live on the other side of the world, it can take quite a long time, particularly with the COVID. Um, um, virus sort of affecting shipping times and whatnot. So I've actually got stock now that I can control when these things go out and which shipping method I use. So it should it should result in a much better experience for people. Um, and it means that you get the right kit as well. So, you know, if you buy one of the SMARS kits, you know, you get in the exact right components. So it's not the, you know, the LED board with something missing. You get in the one that has exactly what um, you want it to have. Uh, same with the Bluetooth modules as well. So when we're selling the kits, we'll probably have a, a few different ranges in them. But to begin with, we've just got 20 and they're just going to be the standard kind of wheeled smars. So you would have the, you know, let me just show you the kind of thing we would have in there. So you'd have the uh, range finder. We would have the uh, battery connector, some DuPont wires. We would have two motors, 150 RPM motors. Uh, I may even solder the wires onto them as well, because for the amount of time it would take me to do that. Um, we could offer maybe some with and some without, see what's popular people prefer them with them soldered on we can do that as part of the uh, the kit and um, you obviously get an Arduino with it as well and I think that's it that's all the electronics you would probably need so I could probably do a few different optional extras like Bluetooth modules and um, the, the face LED matrix as well but uh, yeah that's kind of what I've got planned for the new year just need to figure out boxes and instructions and stuff like that and I'm still waiting for a shipment of all the other Arduino bits and pieces too and the motors so um, yes that's everything I've got for you this week um, hope you enjoyed the show this time and um, yeah it's looking like it's eight o'clock so I think we're right up against the time so we'll not have time to uh, put all that code together into one um, one piece of code that we can run on our Arduino but you get the idea there we can make a, a speaker beep just using, using some very simple components such as this little buzzer these things are ridiculously cheap to buy so um, if you haven't got one built into your your um, Arduino shield motor shield then you can certainly retrofit one of these on as well just plug that into pin 4 and play along with the code that we've just been looking at I'll upload all the code to GitHub. I'll put a link in the description below for people um, who are following along with this on the replay. And you'll be able to download that and play with it yourself. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks for uh, interaction, guys, who've been watching on the live stream. And I shall see you all next week. So bye-bye for now. Oops.